At the corner of Boston's public garden stands a monument. At 12 metres tall, carved from marble and granite, it's the oldest monument in the garden. On the four faces of the plinth, each framed in a Gothic arch, are inscriptions dedicating it to the discovery of anaesthesia, one of the greatest discoveries in medicine. On the pedestal above sits a doctor carved in stone. The body of a man is draped across his knee, and in one hand he holds a cloth. It's a reference to the anaesthetic the monument was built for. But since it was erected in 1868, this monument has been a real puzzle. Who does the carved man sitting on top depict? If Horace Wells had been using nitrous oxide to numb the pain of dental extractions, why isn't his name, or anyone else's, carved on the plinth? The monument is just one of the ways in which the legacy of this discovery is imprinted on Boston. But beneath the surface lies a bitter undercurrent of ambition, betrayal, and a quest for legacy that would continue to the grave. If you'd had a revolutionary idea that could change the course of humanity, what would you be prepared to do to prove that it worked? And how far would you go to secure your legacy? My name is Matthew Heron, and this is Ether Ore. It's the story of the history of anaesthesia, the gases we once used to put people to sleep, and how the safety of patients became central to a modern specialty. When we think about medical progress, we remember the names associated with innovation. But who are the winners, and who are the losers? And when it comes to medical discovery, do the ends ever justify the means? On October the 24th, 1844, the Boston Daily Atlas published a small announcement. Co-partnership notice. This certifies that the co-partnership of Wells and Morton has been dissolved by mutual consent. Horace Wells had invented a new gold solder for dentures. In it, his former apprentice, William Morton, had seen the opportunity to make some money, and in 1843 they entered a partnership together. The offices in a fashionable new Boston neighbourhood and the advertisements that came with it were all proof of Morton's ambition. We have also succeeded in getting the certificate of the most celebrated chemist and geologist in the country in relation to my invention, which will undoubtedly secure a first-rate business to the office, Wells wrote to his wife. His name is Dr. C.T. Jackson, which you have undoubtedly heard of before. But the partnership would be the start of a pattern of behaviour for Morton, who, in the eyes of his partners, sought personal success at their expense. Concerned about money, Wells ended the partnership with that 1844 notice in the paper. The separation was amicable, and by 1845, with Wells back in Connecticut, he asked for a favour. He planned to demonstrate the pain-relieving effects of nitrous oxide in Boston, and he asked Morton to provide the dental equipment. The demonstration was a disaster for Wells, and just three years later, with his relationship with Morton in ruins, Horace Wells would be dead. But William Morton was shrewd, and where Horace Wells saw failure, he saw opportunity. He enlisted the help of Charles Jackson, that famous scientist who'd endorsed Wells' invention. Nitrous oxide hadn't worked, so at the suggestion of Jackson, Morton trialled ether. It had been discovered centuries before, with doctors mixing it with opium to use as a painkiller. On Jackson's advice, Morton experimented on animals before testing ether on himself, pouring it on a handkerchief and inhaling the fumes. The idea wasn't new, and it would turn out that Morton's application of ether wasn't new either. But what we know about modern anaesthesia starts here. It was very scary, the stuff they did in the, in the 1840s when they were figuring it out. I mean, Morton falls asleep looking at his watch while he's breathing ether and wakes up an hour later. You know, and say, he's lucky. You can kill yourself if you have too much. That's Dr. Warren Zapol, former chief of anaesthesia at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Jenny Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. Morton's experiments had proved to him that ether was more reliable than the nitrous oxide Horace Wells had used, 
so much so that he offered an ether-soaked handkerchief to the next patient who arrived at his rooms for a tooth extraction. The decayed tooth was firmly rooted, but as Morton pulled it free, his patient didn't scream. In fact, the pulling of the tooth had failed to rouse him at all, and Morton had to throw water in his face to wake him. It was good stuff, I mean. I mean, Morton was really afraid he'd kill the patient. It was potent. I mean, you had to warm it up to make a vapor. You'd go to sleep and you'd breathe relatively deeply. It was pretty much a respiratory stimulant as opposed to other anesthetics. I think it's even Frost, the grocer on Beacon Hill, pulled his teeth out with sulfuric ether. And even Frost told everybody about it, including the Boston Globe, and they started to advertise painless surgical operations using sulfuric ether, no opium, no hashish, no strong liquors, no compression anesthesia. And one of the surgeons here, he learns about it, and then he and a bunch of the young surgeons go up on the hill and watch Morton pull teeth under anesthesia, and they say, damn it, he's doing it, and it works. Maybe we should invite him to come to the Mass General and show the father of American surgery, the big guy, who was a very acerbic, humorless surgeon, is the guy who brings a patient in and says, all right, I'll try. I know Wells failed. Maybe Morton can do it. Morton had solved the problem of what to use for reliable anesthesia, but how was he going to use it? Ether was a liquid, not a gas like nitrous oxide. He had poured it on a handkerchief for his dental extractions, but now he wanted a piece of apparatus to administer ether vapor to a patient. With a date set for his demonstration at the Massachusetts General Hospital, he rushed to have an inhaler made. His design was simple. A glass globe small enough to sit in the palm of the hand, with an ether-soaked sponge inside. The hand would warm the ether, allowing it to vaporise. A mouthpiece allowed patients to draw air in over the sponge, which would pick up the vapour before it was inhaled. It was ready just in time, and as Morton arrived at the Massachusetts General Hospital on October 16th, 1846, the only other thing he needed was a patient. When we read about the history of medicine, we often focus on the men driving progress, and the story of anaesthesia is no different. It can be difficult to get a grip on the patients, who were often seen as passive participants in discovery. On the face of it, the earliest patients undergoing anaesthesia couldn't have been more passive, as they lay unconscious in an operating chair. The result of anaesthesia might be passivity, but for the patients to get there, they have to be actively involved in making decisions about their own care. Deborah Bowman, Professor of Medical Ethics and Law, and my former lecturer, can tell us more about how doctors gain patient consent for treatments today. Well, I don't know. Do you know what? The more I know about consent, the less I think I probably can sum up what it is. The reason for that is it's, it's a currency. It's a currency in healthcare. So you can't move for consent forms. You can't move for guidance. Of course, it's vital, particularly in Western uh, medical ethics, where autonomy and choice and decision making about the body uh, matter. So, of course, it's hugely significant. But at its simplest, it's seeking permission to do that which we wouldn't normally do to an individual, albeit for their in, in their interests usually but that we recognise that all of us um, have bodily integrity, so we can decide what we do and don't want to happen to us. There are lots, as I'm talking, of caveats in my mind, because I think there are all sorts of things about illness that make it very difficult to be the rational, autonomous person making a finely balanced choice that we conceptualise when we think about consent. And I think there are lots of things about healthcare that make it very difficult to have the meaningful patient-focused conversation that we expect and seek. 
Informed consent talks about sufficient information. The emphasis there on is on the information that the reasonable patient would want. Now, you, you don't need to be um, working in ethics and law to suddenly think, well, who's the reasonable patient and how do you know? And there are many, many questions that flow from that. Providing a patient with enough information to make a decision about a well-described treatment with recognised benefits and risks is one thing. But for Morton, who'd only done limited trials of ether, he didn't know what the risks really were. He'd used it for tooth extractions, but not for surgery. And the demonstration he was organising was just another experiment. So today, when the treatment is experimental and the risks aren't known... Can doctors ever give sufficient information to a patient for them to make a decision and give consent? I suppose I start from a slightly different position in that I think if you're trying to get to a position of sufficient information, you can't really. I think you can give sufficient information about the experiment. And it's a, it's a funny old word, isn't it? It, it evokes so much or it evokes a lot in me when I, I, I hear it. But you can explain, you know, one isn't doing it without a hypothesis or, um, and it might be stronger than that. There might be some evidence from other settings or, you know, there might be there's some information that is making you think this is possible or worth it. And I think there's something, first of all, about the nature of that. So the purpose, the why, why is this being suggested? For what, for what reason? And that can be complex. You know, it isn't always about the patient's interests alone. Morton's patient for the demonstration was a man called Edward Gilbert Abbott. It's not clear why he sought medical attention for the lump on his neck. He'd had it since birth, and it wasn't growing or bleeding or causing pain. And if that was the case, why did he need an operation when the risks of surgery were so high? The hospital records are about as close as we can ever get to his experience, and they show that he'd been admitted to the Massachusetts General Hospital about three weeks before the demonstration. What they don't tell us is what was explained about the experiment that he agreed to take part in. They don't explain why the operation was needed, or why he stayed in hospital so long. Looking at it through a modern lens, I wonder how much say he really had. I'm sure ideas about consent and patient autonomy have evolved since the middle of the 19th century, and Edward Gilbert Abbott may have had his own motivations for taking part. If he needed an operation, you can see how ether would have been appealing. But there were other parties with their own vested interests too. Morton's motivations were driven by a desire to prove his discovery, whether for his own benefit or the world's and Morton's experiment gave the surgeons the opportunity to place themselves at the centre of discovery. Of course, and I I suspect this might not be the case so much in in anaesthesia, but there are bits of medicine where experimental treatment, the pressure actually will come from the patient um, and the patient's family. And I may be wrong, there may be circumstances where that is the case. And I think for me, what's, what's really challenging then is that that's often coming from a perspective of hope and a wish to try everything. And that's very difficult when you then think about consent. Medicine in the 1800s was paternalistic, and it's easy to assume that the pressure for Edward Gilbert Abbott to take part came from Morton. But if he'd read about Morton's painless tooth extractions in the paper, like the hospital surgeons did, it's feasible that he might have requested it himself. The power dynamics can be complex, especially today when we consider experimental treatments for diseases like cancer. There's also something that we overlook in consent, which is voluntariness. And the reason I mention it is because I think in the context of experimental treatment, there's always a power imbalance between the professional and the the person giving the consent or being asked for the consent. And we think about that power imbalance in terms of knowledge and in terms of sort of status and all those kinds of things. I don't mean status um, in a judgmental way, but I mean, you know, it's very different to be in the hospital where you practice and you know everything and it's, it's Monday to you and to be the patient where this is a life changing day that you're never going to forget and you've probably been frightened about for some time. And actually what we don't talk about is emotional imbalance and emotional power. And I think I've not seen this written about very much and I'm... I'm 
interested in it and especially interested in the experimental treatment how you attend to that how you not assume that somebody can't consent that's not what i'm saying at all but how you understand what's driving somebody's questions or lack of questions their wish to pursue this what they can and can't hear and so when you think about experimental treatment you're thinking about the knowledge that you have or more importantly don't have I think you have to think about the nature of uncertainty. I think you have to think about mitigation. But I think you also have to think about the emotion and what's playing out there and the voluntariness. So what's the relationship between that expanding of knowledge and individual interests? And has that been explained? Because explaining risks is not the same thing as explaining that relationship. For me, it's difficult to believe that the power lay with anyone other than William Morton and the hospital doctors. Abbott was a printer by trade, and now here he was in this fantastic centre of knowledge, surrounded by men with an education far beyond his own. And that makes me wonder just how voluntary it all really was. And I I think when I think about your story of the the first chat with Ethan, who had Ethan, I think, well... You know, it's not a coincidence, is it, that he was there, that he was deemed to be the person who was um, suitable to to do this. And his suitability might have been clinical, but it was also a whole load of other stuff. Whether the operation and the ether were offered or imposed, I'm not sure how I'd have reacted if I'd been in his situation. I might have been wary of the risks of an experimental drug. Or, given the alternative, I might have jumped at the chance. We don't know what Abbott thought, but his experience helps us examine our own modern practices and consider how power imbalances in patient-practitioner relationships might be offset. However he had or hadn't been consented for the operation and Morton's experimental anaesthesia, on October 16th, 1846, Edward Gilbert Abbott sat down in the operating chair. William Morton took him by the hand and leaned in. Are you afraid? he asked. No, came the reply. I feel confident and will do precisely as you tell me. The building it was done in is the Bullfinch building. Bullfinch was an incredible architect. He did the White House after the British burned down Washington in 1812 in the war. Bullfinch was still around, and he he built the White House and the Capitol and Mass General and our State House. So he was a great architect, and that's the building that Morton did the work in. You can see it's it's an old Georgian style or whatever it is with the big posts, and way up on top is where the ether demonstration was. The building is typical of Bullfinch's style. Along one of its white granite walls is a great portico supported by six ionic columns, and crowning the whole lot is the dome inside which Charles Bullfinch placed an operating theatre. We used to do one operation a week at most before ether, because it was an awful thing, and the ether dome, which someday when you come to the general you should visit, is up on the top floor, big, thick doors. They used to tie people up there and operate on them. And that's where Morton showed off the, uh, the operation. It's a very steep place with a lot of seats in it. The medical students and the doctors were there in 1846. This is the same dome. That's a skylight so that they would try and operate in the mornings from 10 and 12 or something like that. And they could see surgically. Otherwise, you had to have candles or something like that. It was pre-Listerian antisepsis, right? So they, they were wearing suits and coats. And sometimes they would wash the knives and sometimes they would just wash the handles. Uh, it was kind of a... Not a, not a great time. Morton lifted his glass inhaler up to Abbott's mouth. In five minutes he was asleep, and the famous surgeon John Collins Warren 
worked quickly to remove the tumour from his neck in an operation that was described a few weeks later in the New England Journal of Medicine. The present operation was performed by Dr. Warren and, though comparatively slight, involved an incision near the lower jaw of some inches in extent. During the operation, the patient muttered, as in a semi-conscious state, and afterwards stated that the pain was considerable, though mitigated. When he'd finished, Warren laid down his instruments, and realising Morton had succeeded where Wells hadn't, he turned to the crowd and exclaimed, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. It might have started out as an outrageous experiment, but after his demonstration his technique had been proven, and Morton was keen to secure his legacy. But as he tried to strengthen his foothold on the discovery, his personal and professional relationships would begin to unravel, and the opportunity to cash in would slip through his fingers. As the news reached Connecticut, Horace Wells' wife asked if Morton had discovered something new. No, it is my old discovery, and he does not know how to use it, Wells said, before writing to his local paper, the Hartford Current. If doctors Jackson and Morton claim that they use something else, I replied it is the same in principle, if not in name. After making the above statement of facts, I leave it for the public to decide to whom belongs the honour of this discovery. Morton had tried to capitalise on Horace Wells' gold solder for dentures, and now Wells felt that Morton had taken advantage of another opportunity he'd opened up for him. Wells argued that although the drug was different, the idea was the same, and as such he was owed at least some recognition. But William Morton, now settled in his new partnership with Charles Jackson, was quick to accept the credit. His amicable professional split with Horace Wells was becoming a personal division. As a resentful Wells published letter after letter supporting his claim on the discovery, Morton and Jackson looked to secure theirs, signing a joint patent application 11 days after the demonstration. They developed a commercial preparation that they branded Lethion. The medical community was outraged at Morton's efforts to make money from his discovery. If they didn't know what the active ingredient was, they'd have no choice but to buy Lethion. Morton said the patent was necessary to regulate the use of the discovery, but the doctors argued it was nothing more than profiteering. By the 1st of March, he had a patent. And the MJH said, wait a minute, you got to tell us what you're using, and so you'll, you'll hear about it. The MJH didn't like him, so other people became the anesthetists here. William Morton's relationship with Horace Wells had crumbled, and now his partnership with Charles Jackson would start to falter. As newspapers began printing stories citing Morton as the discoverer, Jackson began to object. All he wanted, he said, was the honour of the discovery. But if there were profits, he should have some compensation. They agreed he'd take 10% of the income, up to $500, a significant sum in 1846, but only a fraction of what Morton expected. Neither of them would see any of this money. The growing pressure from the medical community meant Morton never enforced his patent, and soon everyone would learn that his new drug was ether. Morton's patent was controversial in 1846 and it echoes arguments we're still having today. Modern pharmaceutical companies often find themselves accused of amassing huge profits from new drugs, priced so high that it limits access to them. For the pharmaceutical companies who've invested millions in research and development, the price of a treatment should reflect its value and innovation. It's an emotive problem for doctors and patients trying to access new treatments that they can't get anywhere else especially when that treatment might be the last hope for a cure. Healthcare systems like the NHS have to make a choice about affordability when it comes to new drugs. In the UK, that job falls to the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, or NICE, and the process of deciding which new treatments get funding and which don't poses ethical problems about how we ration healthcare in a resource-limited system. When you're a healthcare system on a budget, 
More money spent on new drugs means less money for everything else. I suppose what I fall back on are um, a number of things, and, and they sound trite, but I think they help us think about it. One is a, a, almost a democratic uh, ethos, I suppose, that the, the trade-off, if you want to put it that way, for a national health service for everybody, free at the point of access, is that there are going to be limits on that, probably. And that we have to attend to, it sounds so easy to say, but so hard to determine in practice, but needs, not wants. Um, and I think, you know, we do have um, we do have exceptions in the context of, say, compassionate use uh, off licence. We have all sorts of things where we can do that if the evidence is good. And I think what we have, um, I've never worked with NICE, but my sense with NICE is what we have is there's an expression uh, often used about the UK and rationing uh, by an American ethicist, which is that we muddle through elegantly. And I don't know how elegant NICE is, but I suppose what I think about NICE is that it does combine a number of things that matter in resource allocation. So one is evidence, which does matter. One is cost effectiveness. It gets more, more tricky, but it, but it matters. It does matter in terms of uh, thinking about uh, impact, I suppose, value. The others are principles, I suppose, principles of transparency, of accountability. So I think in a democracy, there is something about we have to make impossible, difficult decisions. This is the system. This is why. I suppose what worries me, it always worries me, is that the minute you have systems, we're not all equally able to engage with those systems. And so I think there's something about... The, the democrat, democratization of a system and the accountability of it. But then I think you have to think about inequity because I suspect the people who very often advocate for particular treatments may not be those most in need. I, by no means always, of course not. But, but there, there has to be something about whose voice is heard and who's, who's used to using their voice. Morton had failed to profit from his commercial preparation of ether. Instead, he petitioned the United States Congress for $100,000 in compensation, prompting Charles Jackson to travel to Washington to assert his own involvement. The competing claims and confusion meant Morton would never receive a penny. When he died in 1868, the story goes that his wife produced three medals at his hospital bedside. They were the only acknowledgement, she said, that he'd ever received for his discovery. This is Morton's tombstone. Inventor and revealer of anesthetic inhalation. And guess what? Charles Thomas Jackson, eminent as a chemist, mineralogist, geologist, investigator in all departments of science, though his observations, the peculiar effects of sulfuric ether on the nerves of sensation and his bold deduction therefrom, the benign discovery of painless surgery was made. So they fight with each other, even on the tombstone, these guys. By 1873, Charles Jackson was suffering from a psychiatric illness, and he was admitted to the McLean Asylum. The cost of his treatment was paid for by trustees of the Massachusetts General Hospital in recognition for his services in connection with the discovery and use of ether. It wasn't public recognition, but it was something. His grave would stand as a final testament to his involvement, and just a few minutes' walk from Morton's resting place in Mount Auburn Cemetery, it's a reminder of the fierce rivalry that developed between them. I mean, we probably do a thousand operations a day or 700 operations a day. And they were doing one a day, maybe one a week, you know, a half dozen a month in 1845. Nobody wanted it. People would go and shoot themselves. So it really cha it changed the world. Morton led the way. 
As William Morton had worked to secure an income and a legacy, Horace Wells' life was unravelling. His failed nitrous oxide demonstration had been a blow. Falling ill shortly after, he'd withdrawn from dentistry, and at his home in Hartford, Connecticut, he grew increasingly resentful of his old partner. By 1848, he was ready to return to the business of dentistry, and he opened a new practice in New York. He was troubled, consumed by the tug of war with Morton, and by now addicted to chloroform. He didn't know it, but his move to New York would be his undoing. On his 33rd birthday, with a head full of the effects of his addiction, he rushed into the street and threw acid over two women. He was arrested shortly after and detained in the infamous prison, The Tombs. As the effects of the chloroform wore off, the reality of his situation weighed upon him. He worried for his family, but he worried for his sanity more. Were I to live on, he wrote, I should become a maniac. I feel I am little better than one already. He was allowed to return to his rooms under supervision, where he collected the instruments of his destruction. On the 24th of January, 1848, three years after his nitrous oxide demonstration, he cut open his femoral artery with a razor. He was found dead in his prison cell, with a new silk handkerchief saturated with chloroform tied around his head, and the empty bottle discarded at his side. Back in Boston's public gardens, amongst the trees and rising above the competing claims, stands the Ether Monument. And for Warren Zapol, its significance hasn't been lost. I used to think when I was recruiting residents, I'd walk over to it. And it's interesting, they called it a tribute to Ether or either in 1868, because everybody was fighting about who did it. Was it Jackson who fought with Morton over the patent. Jackson certainly suggested the substance to Morton. But anyway, they fought about it like everybody else. <laughs> Inventions are fought of. If there is something in it, they'll fight about it. The fates of the men who had a hand in the discovery were mixed. Morton and his legacy had certainly benefited from the work of others. But he'd also seen the building momentum and had the ambition to capitalise on it. The story makes us question what it means to lay claim to a discovery. And they questioned it at the time too, especially in 1849, when Crawford Long, a doctor from Georgia, came forward to say that he'd used ether for an operation four years before Morton, and had the evidence to prove it. The monument to ether is dedicated to the discovery of anaesthesia, not to the discoverer. But almost 200 years later, it's Morton's demonstration that we commemorate every year on Ether Day, the 16th of October. The parts that Horace Wells and Charles Jackson played in the story are easily overlooked. Edward Gilbert Abbott's role in the story reminds us that patience are never a means to an end. Morton's attempt to profit from Ether was controversial in 1846. And today in the UK, we still struggle to find a balance between a healthcare system that's free at the point of access and one that provides the latest innovations in medicine and surgery. It had taken scientific exploration, self-experimentation and a bit of luck. But now anaesthesia had been discovered, the news would quickly travel across the Atlantic. But once ether anaesthesia arrived in the UK, They'd learn Ether's problems, and doctors would start to wonder how it could be improved upon. An answer would come from Scotland, and a new application of anaesthesia would be challenged by the church. That's next time on Ether All. Special thanks go to Dr. Warren Zapol of Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School for his expertise. Thanks also to Professor Deborah Bowman for her knowledge and insights. The voice of Horace Wells was provided by Adam Unz. Adam is the host of the podcast The Spark Parade, where he geeks out with artists and entertainers about their spark of cultural inspiration. You can listen wherever you find your podcasts. Our music was composed by Nicola Chang, 
and this episode was written, recorded, and edited by me, Matthew Heron. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Ether Or. It helps other people find the show. Thanks for listening. <laughs>